Boa tarde, boa noite, pessoal. Sejam todos bem-vindos ao nosso 44 encontro. Encontro de número 44, para quem gosta de numerais cardinais. Hoje temos um convidado... Bonito. Sejam todos bem-vindos. Temos o nosso 44 encontro, muito especial, nosso primeiro de 2023, com Evan Nesterak, da Behavioral Scientist. Vai conversar conosco sobre comunicação, papel da comunicação eh, nas ciências comportamentais e sobre tudo mais que ele quiser. É um cara super bacana, eh, super eh, in bem informado. E agora eu vou passar para o inglês para fazer uma introdução dele e vou passar a palavra para o Guilherme fazer a primeira pergunta. So, good evening, everybody. Now switching to English, pressing the SAP uh, button. Tonight we have Evan Nesterak. Evan is the head chief at the Behavioral Scientist. In 2013, he co-founded the nonprofit psychology news website, The Psych Report. And in 2016, he helped launch the Philadelphia Behavioral Scientist Initiative. He also researches youth development in sport and is working with the US Soccer Federation to understand the psychological development of players in, the develop, in their development academy. Previously, he researched character development with Angela Duckworth at the University of Pennsylvania, and Evan earned his BA from Swarthmore College in 2009, where he studied psychology and statistics. Evan, thank you very much for joining us this evening, for accepting our invitation. And just to kickstart our conversation, I'm going to switch to Guilherme, and he's going to make the first question. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Great. Uh, well, Evan, uh, again, uh, thanks, thanks for joining. Thanks uh, for the sort of the service provided uh, with, uh, with behavioral scientists. We, I mean, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of readers, a lot of, a lot of fans in the audience. Uh, So I guess I mean just to to start uh, to get the get the ball rolling. Uh, I mean, if you as as uh, Arthur mentioned, you are a, a psychologist uh, by by training and education, and had a quite uh, diverse, uh, quite interesting path. So I mean, if you could just what I mean, just give us a, a hint of uh, on your path, especially what's uh, explaining the. I mean, what the, what what that soccer ball it's uh, it's doing uh, in the in the background, and uh, and uh, and tell us what motivated you to to start uh, behavioral scientists and a little bit on the sort of the early years and what what make you uh, get that ball rolling and uh, and that movement going. Sure, sure, happy to do that. Um... And yeah, thanks again for for having me. It's it's great to great to be here. Great to see some people I got to chat with um, earlier this year, and and meet some meet some new people as well. I had a few conversations, um, all mediated through our tour. So um, uh, it's great it's great to um, see more of the Brazilian community. Um, aspiration at some point is to is to do this in person in Brazil. Um, So, so this, uh, this, I see this, this as a first step, basically. Um, so um, my background is um, uh, a little bit winding in terms of behavioral science, and I'll, I'll try and give the, the highlights, um, but also a little bit of the color that I think makes it interesting. Um, so, you know, out of high school, I went and studied, I went to college, just like a, a lot of people, and didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, really fell in love with psychology there. Statistics was kind of the practical practical thing that I studied in college, but was was really interested in psychology and tried to learn as much as I could. And uh, I graduated in 2009. And as I was winding up to graduate, you know, I was just, I was kind of conflicted because I saw all of this great, I had just studied all of this great research and I felt like it could have an impact on the world, but yet, uh, there was this very rigorous, um, or I wouldn't say rigorous, very narrow path, that, a very traditional path that you kind of had to go down if you wanted to do behavioral science at the time. Um, there were pockets popping up, but they weren't, they weren't publicized. They weren't, um, they weren't really available. Um, you had to go get a PhD or, or kind of nothing basically at that point. If you were going to do a master's, it was maybe more of a clinical side. So I said, well, I just interned with a friend who was getting a PhD and I was like, I'm not ready to do that. So 
I did what I like to call four years of real world college. Um, I kind of came up with that name halfway through to, to stop my friends asking me when I would go get a PhD. But basically the, the gist of it was, is that I decided that, you know, I remember my intro to econ class and maybe you, you, you I know um, some of you studied economics, so maybe this resonates, but there's this problem that they give you when you're an intro to econ, at least in the US. And they say, why do you go to college? You spend all this money, or, or at least in the US, you're spending all this money. You're foregoing your income. You could be making money instead of spending money, but you do it because you know there's a trade-off and you expect the future gain. But for, you know, it's arbitrary and why four years? And so I was thinking to myself, well, four years is kind of arbitrary, but there's kind of an arc. You're a freshman, you're a sophomore, junior, senior. I'll just do four years of random stuff uh, that is going to purpose, purposefully be short term and stuff I'll probably never do again. So that, in, that involved um, being a, a night security guard for three weeks straight at a rodeo in Colorado. I was a sign holder. I don't know if you've ever seen those people on like the, the side of the road, but I did that for five times. And I can tell you, I must have checked my, my bag every time I went to do that. Um, because if I didn't have my iPod uh, and did, like books, audio books at, at that stage, I'm iPod, you know, if you guys remember that, um, uh, I think it would have been the most mind numbing job I've ever done in my life. Um, uh, also did built trails at, on, on, at state parks in, in, a, in Maine, which is in the Northeast of the US. Um, we basically lived outside for three months and I grew this terrible, terrible beard as a 23 year old, that was pretty disgusting. Um, and eventually made my way to the, the Czech Republic where I, I was a caretaker at a property for a year, just out in the middle of nowhere in a village. So I guess, you know, it, it'd be uh, not now people didn't really speak English. So it was, it was really just, uh, uh, just an adventure basically. When I eventually came back to the US, there were things I wanted to do and I always kind of knew okay, these four years of real world college, I'd just be testing a bunch of things out. Eventually I would come back to psychology. And as the years went on, it became more and more apparent that I had scratched some of the different itches and that it was time to um, kind of reconnect with psychology. And so when I, when I came back, I was like, what can I read to kind of get back in, the, in, in up to speed, to, to learn what the latest research is, to figure out, you know, who's applying psychology and behavioral science at the time. And there wasn't really much. I mean, there was a few magazines like Scientific American and Scientific American Mind, where you could kind of read about science is cool would be the category I would put it in. And then there was Psychology Today, which was at least in the US at that time was very, I don't know, kind of fluffy, well, didn't feel rigorous, didn't feel as serious. So there was kind of a gap and, um, I was working at a, this was one of the last jobs I had as a, as a, on my real world college thing, but I was working at an organic food canning company. So we were taking like tomatoes and peaches and plums and all this great fruit and, and vegetables and, and canning it. Um, so that was a useful skill. But during that, I was like, in my free time, I started thinking, what if I started a magazine to try and get leading psychologists at the time to write about their work? Um, because I just don't see it happening. And I know having read all their stuff during college and how, how it, impactful it could be. And that led to the starting of the psych report, um, which was the, the first version of behavioral scientists, I think you could say. Um, and it was very similar to behavioral scientists. It was just much more focused on psychology. And eventually um, I was paying the bills by coaching soccer actually, but um, most of my time was taken up by trying to to do the psych report and get it to work and figure out how to be a journalist. And my brother is an actual, like a, a real live journalist, you know, reporting on crime and stories like that. Um, so he, he, he was a big help and just kind of learned into it. And then in, after doing it for three years, it kind of reached a point where there were a few other groups doing things. Ideas 42 was running Richard Thaler's blog for his book, Misbehaving, which, which had just come out. Um, uh, there was the Behavioral Science and Policy Association, BSPA, was running a blog. And so we kind of decided to combine efforts. And that's really when we got a little bit more resources, a little bit more people. We expanded to do behavioral science. So that was 2016 to 2017. 
And since then, um, we've just tried to, to really stay true to the, the original kind of need way back uh, when I was trying to figure out what to read in like 2010 um, of who's doing really, really interesting work, asking really, really interesting questions about human behavior and human psychology. Um, let's go find it and try and um, connect to other people who are really curious about that too. And I think there's two ways that, that really can have an impact. One, I just find it really fascinating and kind of meaningful to ask questions about who we are and who we can become. That's just like a, a really cool evergreen, I think, philosophy question um, that, you know, since the first human, somebody's been somebody's been looking at the stars, somebody's been looking at the animals, somebody's looking at the plants, somebody's been figuring out why does that person like the plants and why does that person look at the stars and why does that person yell at that person? So there's always always been somebody interested in that. I think that's a long tradition that um, it's kind of fun to be a part of. And then the other side is I think that there are practical applications and good reasons to do different things in your life, different things in your organizations that can have an impact. So um, I really like the practical and the philosophical aspects of it. So that's that's the... I don't know if I, I'm not going to call that the short version because it wasn't short, but that's that's a version of of the story, and hopefully adds some color and 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 some useful history to to behavioral scientists. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Evan, and thanks again for being here with us. And another thank you for I mean making it happen because it's such an important uh, platform for us to have access to such interesting uh, information and data. So now talking a little bit about your current occupation in behavioral scientists, if you could share a little bit with us in terms of the big challenges of actually communicating behavioral science, which can be quite complex at times, to a wider audience and making it attractive and making it accessible. And also if you could touch base in a, a little bit on, on the lessons learned so far for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. One of the, the biggest lessons and one that I think is applicable to behavioral scientists communicating their work, whether to a popular audi audience, to a client, to, um, to anyone really, is we often feel like we're, f I feel like behavioral scientists feel like they should communicate in a certain way. Um, and so one of the challenges for us has sort of been to, to unlearn the models that existed for communication. And uh, an example, and this is, I'm speaking mostly of, of my experience because um, I know more of the training that happens in the US. It may be different in Brazil, but um, just for that, that context. You know, in the US, if you're writing, you know, you're, and you go through a course or you go through anything, you're really kind of pushed to write an opinion piece, an op-ed piece. And those have a very strict form. They're about 700, 800 words. You kind of have to have a clear point of view. It's got to be timely and tied to the news. Um, and there's a problem with that because if you're an academic conducting research at a university and you're like, hey, I just did this really cool study. I spent the last five years of my life thinking about this. I'm one of the only people who knows about this. And I think it can have an impact and I want to tell people about it. A lot of times the advice you get is try and write an op-ed in a publication. And oftentimes there's a mismatch between the interesting research that's being done and what could end up getting published in that very strict format. And so one lesson that we've tried to figure take at, at, at Behavioral Scientist is instead of ch channeling people into one certain format, what we're trying to do is match what we call the natural resources of the behavioral science world with the, the appropriate output. Um, so for instance, you may have a really awesome opinion and, and you've got 20 years to back 20 years experience and 20 years of research to back it up. Perfect. Write an opinion. You know what you may have, um, maybe you don't really want to convince of any, anybody of anything. Um, maybe you're like, you know, I don't know what this means for the policy. I don't know what the government should do, but I do know that I know this, this, and this about people's behavior and uh, and I can think here's here's what might happen if we implement policy A versus policy B. 
Maybe you just need to explain or educate based on your knowledge. And that's a huge service. Um, and so writing an analysis piece would fit that. Um, whereas if you're in a traditional place, you might get forced to have an opinion about it. And I don't think that's necessarily always um, a good thing. Um, and then another one that we see all the time is, again, behavioral scientists are doing a lot of incredible work, but to get that work done, you're, you're really super focused on like one project or one research question or one paper for a really long time. And that's hard if you wanna have opinion that's about a, something very broad or you wanna write an analysis that's very broad, but it's really, really um, valuable to tell people everything you learned or, or for other people to learn from that experience you just had really thinking about that question or that project for three years. Um, and so in that format, what we try and create is sort of what we call a research translation or a, a research or project explainer where people can really just focus on the motivating questions for that project, um, what they did and what the implications are, but not be again forced to connect it to some election or um, uh, some, some conflict that's going on uh, you know, around the world or whatever it might be. Um, and so the generalized lesson that I think for people communicating at any time is to really spend time thinking about, you know, what is what is what did I really just do, and what is my perspective here? Because chances are, there's I, I know something that a bunch of other people don't, and it would be valuable for them to learn it, and then try and figure out how do you, what do you focus on to communicate that, um, and uh, and and I think that process of really figuring out what your unique perspective is, is something we're trying to encourage more and more writers to do. Um, so that's, that's uh, I think a little bit of stuff, something that we've learned and something that we've tried to apply into how we're, we're um, channeling pieces um, to be published. Great, you have a, a very nice to so, so understand more about uh, the history behind and all the challenges uh, that you face. Uh, one question that we that we have here is you deal with so much information and a lot of research every day. And how do you see the future of this field of behavioral science in terms of research and discoveries? which authors and researchers deserve more attention from the general public in your opinion? Hmm. So where do I see it going? It feels like the first question and the second question is who deserves more attention? Is that, do I have that right? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we all know, you know, any prediction that we all make is gonna be wrong. So um, I'll say that as a caveat to any prediction I'm about to make. I think, Something that I think I've I've seen happen over the last three, four years as, as behavioral science kind of settled a little bit after a rapid growth phase um, with units popping up, a lot of interest being generated, books being published. What I've seen is that people are trying to go deeper on the questions and look for and deeper on solving the problems. And I, I'm actually really encouraged by that. It might feel like we're in a little, uh, the field is in a little bit of, a, of a, a transition period, but I think it's really encouraging that a lot of organizations and a lot of leading figures, um, Michael Hallsworth being an example, are trying to really think deeply about, here's everything that we've learned, what do we do now? And what do we do now isn't, Let's just sell more of it. Um, let's just, you know, find the next people, find the next market that we haven't tapped yet. What do we now is really about, I think, deepening our understanding of what behavioral science can do, how it can fit in in different ways in different places. And so I think the next three, four, five, six years are really going to be about asking really tough, really deep questions about what's possible for behavioral science, finding the, the, the kind of boundaries of our knowledge. We all have our own boundaries of our knowledge. We have our own expertise. 
starting to team up with people who have nice overlaps um, and complement, and then starting to form, I think, um, starting to speak a similar language about solving problems through behavioral science, but with these multidisciplinary, multi-perspective, multi-experience teams. I think that's where it could go if people kind of keep asking these deep questions like, so what? Yeah, we can do this, but I wish we had been able to do it a little bit more. And it's kind of this in, intrinsic motivation to, to get better and to actually do what you hope to do. And I think, I think that's, that's, that's really encouraging. Um, and I think an, another aspect of like where I think this is going and it's related is I think there's a, I think there's a, a really big opportunity to understand other specific, uh, specific behavioral sciences. So if you know sociology, starting to understand how economics asks, asks questions about human behavior. If you understand economics, really trying to understand what's a psychologist's stance towards understanding human behavior. How do they ask questions? What are their methods? Anthropologists, political scientists, people in public policy, people in tech, people in design. You know, all of these people are, are coming at behavioral science and human behavior in really unique ways, in ways that add a lot of value. But that you get to that value from the disciplines by in a way kind of putting blinders on to asking questions in other ways. And you can only really, um, I think, realize the value of, of everybody's work if, if there's a, in a place to integrate it. And so again, so that's one of our aspirations is to, to get more anthropology, sociology, political science on, on our website. So behavioral scientists get exposed to those ideas, start incorporating them, start forming teams. Um, and I hope that is a, something that I, I hope that is something that helps deepen the questions that people ask and allows people to feel like it's possible to ask those really big questions um, about these thorny problems. And, and make progress on them. So that's, I think, part one of, of the question. Part two, who should we pay, be paying attention to more? Um, that's another aspiration of ours is to get more emerging writers in. Um, I would say we're, yeah, we're always looking for emerging, like writers who aren't, let's say established, um, names in the behavioral science world, writers who are early in their career but have something to say. So um, I would keep an eye out for that, but I guess it depends. Like I think on our pages, we have our contributors list and then you can kind of sort it by discipline. That might be a great way to find people who aren't book authors. Um, you know, I think Michael Hallsworth, you, you obviously know him, but he's got his manifesto coming out. And I think that's gonna be a really interesting discussion piece for, for the field. Um, I think uh, Christina Graver, she's at in Copenhagen, um, worked with her. I think she has some really interesting perspectives as well, has done a lot of applied and academic work. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm actually, most excited about is trying to go find go find new people. Um, so like right now, one of our editors is having a bunch of calls with um, people in all different disciplines where we don't have like a very close network. Um, and we're trying to lean more into that. And one another person is Allison Daminger. She has a sub stack. She, she writes, she wrote in our, our print issue, she studies gender in the household. And she wrote a great piece for us called um, a cognitive, a, a labor, a cognitive labor of love. I think it was in, in Brain Meets World or, or something like that. Um, and she talks about the, the gender division of, of, of cognitive labor, cognitive effort in the household. I think it's just really interesting perspective. Um, so those are a few names. And I would say that if there are people that 
you think would be valuable voices for behavioral scientist type readers to hear about, send me names. I'd love to, I'd love to learn from you all who, who you think um, more people should be, should be listening to and, and hearing from. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Evo. Very nice. Thank you, Evan. Uh, we have a question from the audience, Vera Rita. Please, the floor is yours. Hey, many thanks, Artu. First, I love your last answer. Yes, deep questions, deep uh, probing. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, by the way, I'll send you the name of a young Danish kid, also a researcher, who's doing stuff on poverty. Very interesting, all over the world. So I, I forgot his, his last name. His first name is Christian also. Anyway, uh, first, many, many thanks for behavioral scientists. I'm, I'm joining the colleagues here. I'm a big fan also. And we know that it's a lot of effort. So many thanks. Thank you. Now, I'd like to ask you about the audience. Who do you think or know maybe uh, your audience is? And who would you like your audience to be? Do you have like a dream audience you'd like to reach or something? Thanks. That's a, that, that's a great question. Um, this, is, this is a question, you know, we've been thinking about since the beginning of doing the SEG report, you know, who, who's the audience? Who's gonna read it? Um, what are they looking for? And it's, it's really been a dance over the years. Um, and I think it's, what we're, I'll, I'll give you the ending and then I'll, I'll peel it back. So I, I won't, I won't, um, I won't bury the lead, so to speak. The, the ending is what we're trying to do at Behavioral Scientist with a lot of our articles is reach a broad audience. And you could call them a knowledgeable non-specialist, you know, somebody who's curious and smart and engaged um, but they might not have the technical jargon of a psychologist. And if you think about it, an economist doesn't always have the technical jargon of a psychologist. A psychologist doesn't always have the technical jargon of, a, of an anthropologist. And so I think by hitting that audience, you not only can reach a broad audience, but you can start cross-pollinating the, the, the behavioral sciences themselves. Another aspiration of ours, and this really was a realization after we did Brain Meets World, um, the print issue, was we were getting a lot of inspiration from literature and poetry and great art. And it occurred to me as I was um, looking at other magazines for inspiration that, you know, a really great piece of literature can, can speak to so many different groups of people at the same time. And, you know, it's not only for doctors, it's not only for scientists, it's not only for people in marketing, it's not only for, um, you know, uh, people who are curious about um, outdoors, not only for curious people about sports, whatever it might be. It really, and, and the reason it hits all those groups is because great literature will ask deep, meaningful questions about who we are and who we can become, which are the same questions that I think behavioral scientists are asking with different methods. And okay, the reading a great piece of literature is probably 10 times more enjoyable, if not more than reading an academic article. I think we can all agree on that. But the questions and the ideas and the brain power going into answering them, I think are, are very similar. So we, tried to, we now try and think about, instead of really segmenting our audience and you know this is a piece for this really specific and trying to divide and figure out who's doing what, we're, we're really trying to now search for ideas and questions that a broad audience could get. And so I'll be a little bit more specific about who the broad audience is. You could imagine professionals who may not be professional behavioral scientists, but they're using behavioral science some way in their work or they want to incorporate, it, incorporate in their work. You could imagine creatives, designers, artists, writers who, just like I might go to a literary journal for inspiration on what we do at Behavioral Scientists, they might come to us for inspiration. Students, of course, um, and, and other professors and, and people who are uh, professional behavioral scientists. And I think if you 
you can't do it with every piece. Um, and there are some pieces that are only gonna hit a few of those. But I think if you try and figure out ideas and questions that can hit all, that each one of those groups can get something out of, you end up um, reaching, being able to reach more people, but you also end up asking, I think, more interesting questions and trying to find more interesting ideas. So that's a little bit how we've thought about our audience. Um, I think in the long term, I would love, I, I know right now that our, at least for Brain Meets World, it was, I think, something about 50% of the recipients came from outside the US, which I think is pretty cool. Not something we were expecting. I probably would have expected maybe 75% or something like that um, to, to be in the US. And that was really exciting. And we tried to really lean into that. And so, you know, we're a small team, so things only move so fast, but we're, we're really hoping to get more writers from outside the US to, to on our pages. And, you know, an aspiration in the long term is that again, if you're bringing in more writers and more ideas from different parts of the world, you're creating a much richer sort of tapestry of, of knowledge, of insights, of ways of going about things. Um, you know, there are, I, I think, I, I don't know um, who I was mentioning this to, but there are so many interesting and unique things about different cultures. You know, Brazil is a great example. Um, it would be awesome to figure out, you know, what's the thing about Brazil, their, your, your all take on behavioral science that, you know, someone in, in the Northeast in the US is never gonna think of, right? And I think there's so much potential for readers and writers to get something from those perspectives. Um, so we're really trying to think of, a, of our audience as being international and global. And, um, and from, from those kind of walks of life, because I think, uh, I think in the end, it's a, where people, people are asking really big questions about human behavior and people are curious about who we are and why we do what we do. And so let's kind of create one, a, a community around that, around that conversation, even if it's not always happening in real time. Many thanks. Can, can I just ask a real quick one? Because you've mentioned uh, brain meets the world, and I've been intrigued. Why brain rather than mind? Is there a special reason? Um, you know, there was a, the, I don't know if this was a, a conscious reason, but there was a, a, a sort of kids sitcom in the US growing up called Boy Meets World. Um, and I think we played with a lot of different titles and then at some point, Brain Meets World became the working one and um, it kind of stuck. I think we probably tested mind. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if we was like, we, we didn't have a debate about either two, but I think the, the sound of it um, rang true. Um, there was a familiarization, familiarity there. Um, so maybe, maybe that was the reason um, that it stuck over, over something else. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Evan, uh, I have a two-part question for you uh, about the, the role of the communication for uh, behavioral science. Uh, we know in different, so many areas, uh, there's a gap between academia and pr practicing, right? Academics and practitioners uh, does, don't always look eye to eye. Uh, practitioners don't publish and academics often don't take their, their research further into the wild. So there's a gap uh, between academics and practitioners. And I would like to know uh, what you think is the role of communication as you are somebody who is in the middle of it. And uh, the second part of my question, I believe, and it's a personal assumption, uh, that in behavioral science, we have a, a second gap between uh, practitioners and no practitioners. We talk about public policy, but we don't talk enough with politicians. We talk about uh, designing for health, but we don't talk enough with doctors. We talk about education, but we don't talk enough with teachers. I don't know if you agree with this assumption, but how could uh, communication help us 
to close these gaps and bring this community together, as you said? Okay, so great question. So the gap between academic and practitioners and then the gap between practitioners and non-practitioners or, or professionals um, who you might be working with. That's a really good question. Um, I may, I was jotting down some notes about stuff that I, I'm interested in thinking about and talking about and was potentially gonna mention. And I think this may be the place to mention it and it may get at both, both questions. Um, we'll see. And that is that there's research is in many ways a retrospective activity. It's almost like history. You're trying to find out why something works or why something happens. Um, uh, if there's a science, any scientists, feel free to disagree who are, who are practicing research. Um, and there are different ways to do it. An intervention may be more I'd say entrepreneurial, let's say it, or, or um, but you know, um, oftentimes when I was doing research with Angela at Character Lab, one big realization I had was um, that their the the researchers' tools oftentimes are going into a place and figuring out why is this school more successful than that school, you know, what are these things that make these kids successful, and you're trying to figure it out. But what you're studying oftentimes, you're studying that one star teacher or that, that class that somehow is, is doing better on the tests or, or, or has more belonging or whatever it might be than the other class. And you're trying to pull that apart, but something is causing that. And a lot of times it's a really dynamic, interesting, um, forward thinking person. Um, you know, I think of, uh, I, have a, I have a soccer ball in the background, obviously. So I, I like soccer. Um, and I think about coaches all the time um, being really, really um, attuned to human psychology and human behavior, are, but they might not know exactly why they're doing what they're doing from a scientific perspective, but they are really, really wise when it comes to um, getting the best out of people, understanding what people need, how to talk to people, all of those things. And so the answer to closing those gaps, I think, if, if the practitioner is the common person there, I really think a sort of almost entrepreneurial mindset um, of, you know, at, rather than maybe expecting the answer from, to come from academia, um, taking inspiration, but having the confidence to go figure it out and realize like your role, I think a practitioner's role in some in some cases in behavioral science is to be one step ahead of the research in a say, to figure out something that a researcher should go figure out, hey, that's really interesting. Why does that work? Could it also work over here? Um, but the practitioner is probably thinking more about how do I solve this problem that I really care about and that this person I'm working with, my client or these stakeholder really cares about. And how, I'm, I'm using behavioral science to find it. And that's, Maybe the, the, the flip, the, the answer to the second question too, because in a way, if you're thinking about how does behavioral science impact health or how can behavioral design um, improve education, if you take it maybe a little of an entrepreneurial mindset to it and figure out how can I get started? How can I make progress on something? How can I do everything that, you know, an entrepreneur would do to try and solve a problem? You... You, you start closing those gaps because you start, I think, finding people who you're working with. And then I think that's where, it's almost like that's the precursor to, I think, communication about it. Um, finding someone who's willing to work on a problem with you, be it an academic or be it a, a, a non-practitioner, a non I think is the first step to really figuring out what, what you might, need to communicate more broadly in those gaps. Um, and so I think one thing that, that gets overlooked a lot of times is the role of the, the applied community, the behavioral design community, the practitioner community as a sort of um, vanguard of trying to figure out what actually works in the wild. Um, 
I think the, the, the academics have a, have a really robust system for generating knowledge and ideas and insights. And that's, you know, decades and decades and decades in the making. Um, so that's like that pipeline and that plumbing and all that stuff is completely laid out. And it's, and it's easy for us as editors to go find stuff in there because of all that infrastructure. But from the practitioner community, it's very segmented. There's only pockets. That's almost like trying to be a detective or just talking to enough people and, and trying to figure out what's happening. Um, so I would say as a first step, it's, it's about maybe shifting the mindset to being like, hey, here's the role I play in this ecosystem of behavioral science is really at this, could be at this forefront. The second one is potentially finding people who you're, you're um, to, to have like frank conversations with, because that's the easiest form of communication to figure out. And then the third stage would be maybe figuring out, hey, this is a, this is a pattern I'm seeing now it needs to be communicated more broadly or written about more broadly. Um, there's, there was one other aspect to this that I think is that I wanted to mention. And that is, oh, the, when I was starting, this is a really valuable lesson. So when I was in Philadelphia, I was partnering up with a couple of professors and some who had connections with city government and it was actually fairly quick, but we were able to get a, a behavioral science team going in the city. Um, I played a very peripheral role in that. I was kind of helping facilitate, connecting, doing these things. Um, but it was successful and there was a lot of people who were able to come together in one city, in one, like, but there's probably 10 or 15 universities in that, in that one city. Um, or colleges and universities of varying size of people of varying interest. And so what I thought was really cool about that when we, when we had the initial conference is that you're now getting all of these different academics and all of these different people in government in a room together. And they all have this shared motivation to make Philadelphia a better city. They all see, they, they like literally see the problems with their eyes as they walk to work and they can connect on it and share it. And so I actually think there's a, a probably an underutilized um, uh, strategy for I think making like more local change and probably maybe even lasting change, which is to develop like localized behavioral science communities um, who if you can get the right decision makers and, and brains together, um, and they're motivated to solve a problem. I think that's I think that's a really powerful and potentially underutilized. We kind of fly in the expert, um, and like, it's no different for uh, a lot of places, you know. Um, but I think now there's enough expertise in a lot of different places where, if local groups can form, um, there's a lot of a lot of potential there. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yes, of course. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Evan, one question that uh, I mean, uh, we have to make is sort of the question of the month, uh, which is uh, about the, the role of uh, generative algorithms, chat GPT mm -hmm. and all. Uh, I, I went, actually, I went to, to, to an event today and there was a Microsoft guy that actually said something uh, slightly different or, or at least an interesting take that... Uh, he said that, uh, well, actually, we will not going to be replaced by, by AI. We are going to be replaced by people that know how to use AI uh, uh, to their benefit or to improve, the, to improve processes and, and products. So my question is whether you guys have already thought through or, or uh, consider uh, how those uh, tools could impact uh, the work that you guys do at uh, behavioral scientists and beyond, and beyond? Um, well, my first answer is I have no idea. Um, it's a great question. You know, I'm really, I'm really excited to see what behavioral scientists are doing with it, to be honest. Um, you know, there's obviously been a lot of hot takes and, you know, people, you know, if you're on social media, you see people doing really amazing things. You know, if you had showed me that a year ago, I'd been like, that's amazing. But because I chat, 
GPT-3 just came out, I was like, oh, I've already seen that. You know, it's like, it's amazing how fast you kind of um, acclimate Thanks to the, the, yeah, the, the technology. Um, but I'm, I would say, I, I think there is, I, I was talking about somebody, I, I was talking about this with somebody yesterday who runs a tech company in Silicon Valley and they were fearful of the same point that you just made, which is basically, it takes so much knowledge to be able to operate these systems and, you know, semesters of really complex math and everything like that, that um, only a small, small portion of the population could probably do it and want to do it. Um, but if it wields like this power, then you end up concentrating all of the, you end up doing exactly what I guess the Microsoft guy said, which is concentrating the knowledge and the power and everything with that one group. So I'm, I'm pretty fearful. I, I don't know about that specific prediction, but I would say if social media and that trajectory is any indication, uh, it's gonna, it may start out being a democratizer or something that's interesting or useful, um, but it could quickly devolve into just making more money for people who already have a lot of money and making the internet a more kind of advertised place to navigate. Um, you know, you search your, your G chat GPT search engine and all of a sudden, you know, like some you're getting a recipe for Italian food from Olive Garden or something like, I don't know if you get guys will get that reference, but it's just like, a, it's a, it's a very fine chain Italian food chain in the U S but it's not necessarily like, I, I personally wouldn't want to copy my Italian recipe from it. I'd want to get an actual Italian recipe. So, you know, I, that's the minor stuff in terms of work and, and behavioral science and us at behavioral scientists, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, I, I'm afraid that the next three years, people will try and outsource expertise, basically, right? If all of a sudden you don't have to write or you kind of don't have to think, like I think it's gonna take three to five years for people to realize, hey, you can't, you can't outsource you know, expertise. You personally will not get better at your job, get better at thinking, have a, have a, have a more fulfilling life, just because you can uh, do a job faster or in a, an acceptable way. Um, it's just like it took probably three, four, five, six years on, for everyone on social media to realize, you know what, like poking or someone on Facebook or liking something doesn't, doesn't replace like meeting up with someone in person, um, having a beer with them, chatting with them, having a coffee, whatever it might be. So I'm... Um, I'm personally going to try and avoid the cycle and just mm -hmm. keep trying to improve writing and editing um, uh, without chat GPT's help. But I might be a Luddite. I might be, I might be in the dark ages. Who knows? Ask me and ask me in like three weeks, right? <laughs> it could be totally cool. <laughs> you do. Thank you, Evan. So I'm going to go back to the behavioral scientist specific <laughs> issue. I mean, we'd like to hear from you in terms of uh, what do you think about the weird perspe perspective? I mean, do you think behavioral science still focused on the weird scenario? And if so, if you still believe, do, how do you think we can get out of this scenario? And if, you, if you're against it, what has been done to change it? Yeah. Um... I'm going to give a sh I'm going to try and give a short answer and then I want to ask the question a question back to you basically which is um my short answer is people conducting research have constraints um the constraints 30 40 years ago were trying to find participants and those participants were on college campuses so they did the work and then made a lot of claims based on a very small sample. Um, so nowadays, I think the convenient sample comes from online. 
online samples. And that's also, uh, there are just constraints and people need to collect data and do their jobs and find things out. It's imperfect. It's maybe slightly better than college students, um, but it still has its limitations. Um, and so I'm hopeful that through collaborations, through different groups doing behavioral science around the world, there will be a more openness to sort of saying, hey, we did this thing. It kind of looks like this thing you did over here. You found this, we found this. It seems like the story might be this, right? A more integrative approach to doing your work rather than I did this here. I discovered, you know, something that no one else had ever seen before. And, you know, I'm, I'm amazing, right? I think, I think we're going to a much more collaborative way, I hope. And so I hope that that deepens our understanding and also adds a sort of humility to any of the claims that we make. I'm still totally in for people having a really amazing, interesting stance, having an opinion on what they think the data means, being bold, being curious. Um, I think that's where you start having to actually really interesting and useful debates. If, everybody, if no one takes a side, it gets kind of boring. Um, but at the same time, if we all have that humility in the back of our minds, there's a, an easier, you're not arguing for your own position, you're arguing to find out more, which I think is different. And so the question I'd pose back to you um, would be, do you think that there's an over-reliance on, uh, I, I guess over-reliance, an over-reliance on, let's say, studies and knowledge generated in the US um, over maybe psychology that's happening in Brazil, let's just say. Like, do people value the US based more? Why do you, why do, why do you think that is? Um, yeah, that'd be my, I guess that would be my question. I would yeah. kind of pose back. I mean, I can start and I'll ask, I mean, I'll, I'll give uh, the floor to my, my colleagues to express their opinions as well. But I think yes, definitely, still. I mean, first, the field is still very restricted in Brazil. I mean, there has been some research, there has been some practitioners actually, uh, you know, doing work, applied work, but still, I mean, we, we ourselves look for the US and elsewhere in the world. The, the BIT, you know, and other um, well-known groups already. So there's still a lot of space for growth in Brazil in every sense of the way. I mean, within universities per se, very little public universities actually dedicate um, specific uh, disciplines to uh, behavior economy or behavior economics or social sciences or, well, not social sciences, but behavioral sciences in general. So there are a lot, I mean, we do have some private universities investing uh, much, much more than the others. And, you know, specific students within the public universities, which are the majority, I would say, the majority of the research comes from them. So they themselves have the interest and they by themselves produce um, research. But there needs to be a more institutional interest and involvement as well for us to grow. Se alguém, quiser, se alguém quiser contribuir, Vera, por favor. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really strange here because economic psychology or psychology involved in, in behavioral science is less um, relevant, less big than behavioral economics or behavioral finance, particularly. Uh, so we have people... Uh, from banks who are really interested in the area. And um, or we have some economists beginning, of course, but we have less so in psychology itself. And uh, that's one of my dreams, you know, to have a Latin American economic psychology, because I think we, we had a chance to, to chat about this that time. Um, in Brazil, social psychology is quite different from uh, 
what it is like in, in the US or in Europe or other countries. So it would be interesting to, to have this kind of contribution and uh, cross fertilization and all that. I hope I'm alive to see it. <laughs> tell, tell me more, tell me more about how social psychology is different. Like what, what would be a sort of, um, I'm really curious about, about it. It feeds more on sociology mm -hmm. and uh, political studies. And um, it has sometimes a Marxist uh, perspective, something that we don't hear about anywhere in behavioral science in general. It's almost like a taboo. And um, sometimes it, it goes to an extreme that I don't like either, that they, they almost throw out the baby with the, the water because they don't regard the mind as, you know, as relevant, they they consider only the environment. Um, but it's interesting. It would be interesting to take this discussion further and uh, see what happens. But um, yeah, I, I had, a, for instance, when when I started trying to teach, you know, an introduction to economic psychology here, I had many colleagues looking down on it and uh, they were very prejudiced and saying that economic psychology would be an expression of capitalism and uh, mm. so you know it's the the extremes but um, I don't know this is 20 years ago so maybe now it's it's a bit different but we do need uh, like Juliana was saying we do need uh, a research line more you know formally instituted and all that and a hub i'm always thinking about a hub you know to get everybody together to organize the research around you know um maybe a, a behavioral scientist could be this hub huh? <laughs> can i can i ask another question and anyone in the group sure. i guess um I'm, I'm actually really curious so um when you're, if you're reading a piece of research or you're reading, could be even something on behavioral scientists, um, I'm happy to take, take any constructive criticism. And um, let's say you're reading a piece of social psychology from the US. I, I'm wondering, are there times when you're reading that and the way it's presented where you're like, that is definitely not true in Brazil or um, actually I'm surprised you know, that, that is like Brazil, but I wouldn't have expected it to be like Brazil, like based on the study or something. So surprise places where you're like, yeah, they're talking about like that being some natural thing of human nature. And I'm like, that would never fly in Brazil or, or, or anything or, or places where you are surprised where there might be overlap. I'll offer two, uh, two uh, at least at least in my view, uh, I mean, one that's sort of tried and tested or, or experimented and failed in a way is, I mean, the whole, the whole uh, discussion on, on social norms, like the classic tax nudge, uh, mm -hmm. that's, that, that doesn't fly uh, in, uh, in Brazil, as far as I know, in other countries in South America, just because, I mean, social trust is, is completely different. The social, the way that uh, trust is enforced and lived through in society uh, is completely different. I mean, there is trust uh, in, in, in Brazil, but it's not in the institutions or, or in abstraction, it's trust in family, trust in friends. So what, I mean, who cares if 85% of people do pay their taxes? I'm curious whether <laughs> my mom paid the taxes or my neighbor pays the taxes. So that's one. Uh, but on a, on a broader perspective, and that's my view, and if anyone's, anyone disagrees, feel free. Uh, I mean, just the whole discussion that uh, maybe 30, 40% of the pages in Nudge take on the whole libertarian pater uh, paternalism, uh, which in my view, in my reading, they're kind of walking in a razor thin line not to, not to upset uh, Democrats or Republicans. I mean, that's, I mean, I completely, you know, on, my, on, on, our, on my view, I mean, yeah, at least in, in the Brazilian context, it's just uh, a pointless discussion. I mean, I mean, 
I mean, paternal, paternalism is not really a sin. I mean, if you, or, or uh, if it is, uh, I mean, it's okay to be paternalistic in some cases. It's not a taboo, as as Vera said. So, uh, so, and uh, unfortunately, in a way, sort of a little bit of, of that mindset uh, kind of got imported uh, or a little bit of the, of the, of the ideological discussion about uh, the role of uh, the role of the state and the role of uh, of the individual uh, sort of got imported in Brazil in recent years, uh, which I don't think it's. Uh, it, I mean, it, we're importing a discussion without the without the context, but or the history, but uh, but, but that, that whole discussion, for instance, is something that that, 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 I, that, I, that while mm -hmm. I was reading on the nudge, I was like, okay. The, all right. I mean, I, I'm not going to kill you if you say you're paternalistic. I mean, just just move move on with it. So that's me. Sorry. That's really interesting. I I agree. Uh, hi, Evan. Um, I agree with Guilherme on that. Um, I think like here we have way more paternalistic policies. that are uh, completely normal in a sense. So when it uh, comes to retirement saving plans here we have it mandatory or smoking bans and so all the discussion on that that sometimes feels as contradictory for us uh, would be normal and so nudges in that sense uh, wouldn't impact that much and also I feel that all the focus and the discussion on climate change uh, nudges and in the whole behavioral change area I think it has grown a lot in the past years but I feel that this is an agenda way more uh, relevant in Europe and in the US. And I don't, uh, not that it's not important, but I don't think uh, here in Brazil, it, it has that kind of uh, relevance, maybe in the social mobilization sense as it has uh, in these other countries. Vera? That's really interesting. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I agree with both uh, Guilherme and uh, Flora. And uh, uh, for me, it gets me more often wondering because we don't have as many findings here. So I, I keep wondering, would this really work here? You know, would, would it be the same? And this is a very common question uh, my students ask me. Uh, is all this that we study about biases, for example, all that, uh, would it work in other countries as well? I know that Kahneman keeps saying we have tested in every country, but he's tested in Israel, in the US, in, the, in Europe. I, I'd like to see more on Africa, uh, on the global south in general. And I think that the, the point about uh, the cognitive social psychology perspective that is much more towards the individual and less so about the context. That's why I really like the Lowenstein's, I call him the God, because I really like his views. Uh, Lowenstein's last article, thank you, Arthur, for drawing my attention to this. And uh, I, I think that, you know he's he's on the on the right way <laughs> maybe maybe coming closer to uh psychology here in brazil to brazil probably uh unbeknownst to him but <laughs> likely but uh it, it's interesting to see that this discussion may be starting over there also Well, I, I agree with Guilherme, Flora, and Vera, uh, but there's also, I think, on my perception that uh, related to the area of behavioral science here in Brazil, we are much step, much, many steps behind U.S. So uh, sometimes when you say about applying behavioral science, we still have to evangelize people. We have we we have trouble to sell projects. We have trouble to 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 tell politicians this will work. So uh, in that sense, when we uh, read or know uh, projects and policies applied in US, it still feels a little distant for us. That's really interesting. Um, I, sorry, it, just adding, it's a nightmare to find an advisor 
for for your PhD, you know, in this area, it's it's hell. There's no one. Very very few. Mm. I'm wondering. I'm I'm just wondering, and and I I don't know, um, the the Brazilian context for trying to get projects done at all, but I'm I'm curious if that you know there's a very there in the U.S. at least there's a very tried and true path for a a sort of think tank style consultant to come in with a new idea to a government, the government to have a budget to pay a consultant to do that, or the or a company to have a budget to pay a consultant to do the thing. The companies want to compete with the other company. So whatever it might be, they're kind of trying to stay at the edge. But there, but that's sort of built into the business culture and the in the public public institution culture. So I'm wondering if there's I'm wondering if there's like a if there needs to be a different angle in to to doing projects in different parts of the world where um, where you know maybe the start is on something where there's the most robust connections or the things that the people care about the most. Um, I mean, family people in America or in the US say they, they care about family and they probably do, but at the same time, you know, it's an extremely individualistic culture. Um, and I've been to a bunch of other places where families feel much more close and tight knit than than in the US. So is family a place where behavioral science gets its foothold? I don't know. I'm just I was just going off Guillermo's Guillermo's point about about um, not caring, not caring what the 85% do, but but what your friends do. Um, I don't know, I'd be curious to hear people's thoughts if there are if there are other avenues or other ways that maybe try and use a, if there's a Brazilian model that's that's needs to be discovered, I guess. Um, I don't know. Well, we need uh, funding. Yeah. We, uh, well, <laughs> uh, funding. Vera, Vera will solve that. She, she'll talk with uh, a couple of uh, of her, her people that she, that she knows from. Uh, B3, uh, which is the, the stock exchange in Itaú, and they, they will fund the think tank for us. Uh, but uh, but one thing, <laughs> one thing that uh, that uh, that's still that's still uh, in my view uh, a cultural problem, a cultural challenge that uh, I don't have the answer is that, uh, uh, and I don't want to be simplistic and and and, and just calling that a sort of a macho culture but maybe a, a sort of a rejection of the of the of the risk of incertitude which is mm -hmm. the the problem with the experimentation side so uh for a government uh uh to say in, in Latin America the only guy that I ever heard actually saying well, actually we are trying and if and if and if it doesn't work uh will we'll change was Pepe Mujica from Uruguay but he's but he only did that because he's like 85 year old and an old anarchist. <laughs> but uh, but uh, 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 a mainstream politician actually saying, "Well, I don't really have the answers, but uh, we will uh, we will test and uh, and uh, and measure and uh, have rigor, and then uh, and then if that go if that works, we we roll out." That's still uh, um, that's still uh, a bit of a taboo in terms of the public discourse. I mean, you have. Quite a few people, I mean, Flavia, Rita have trained loads of the, loads of those people in the public service that uh, have the skills and the will, but sort of on the on the uh, on the top level of of decision of public decision making specifically, or even in corporations, uh, the 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 admission the admission that you really don't know the answer uh, that you're gonna test it's uh, it's still a taboo. Uh, Does does I know from my my friend uh, he I know he he has a tech company and so he has hired some people from Brazil and I think that's is the is there a there's a big is there a big tech industry in Brazil because like I mean if they're doing A B testing I'm wondering if if because uh, the government I think at least in the U S the government wasn't doing much testing but when all of the people that they would hire for their 
any of the technical things started going to Silicon Valley because the pay was like seven times as much. Um, and you know, you got amazing perks. Uh, they started trying to draw inspiration from that. I don't know if there's a similar path to be developed in Brazil between um, if there's a if, if there's sort of an emerging tech tech group that that could influence. I don't I don't know, but um, that that's something that feels like it happened in the U.S. and was it was a big influence was was that was the the tech space could be potentially setting the stage. I don't know. Laura, I think. Yeah, I think even before discussing like funding or the lack of capacity inside the uh, public sector, I think it's a matter of understanding how the public sector works in Brazil, like understanding its proper logic and create the behavioral science agenda just like any other policy agenda. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, you have to have uh, like policy entrepreneurs, which is the concept that someone inside the public policy actually believes in that idea and uh, knows how to play the game of how mm -hmm. it works. For example, mm -hmm. if you were to hire a consultancy or a provider, you have to uh, to build a licitation process in order uh, as you can hire. You have to understand the hiring mechanism and uh, make sure that there is a match. Um, when I was in the um, in the city hall, we we actually had this mechanism, but it was much easier if we had a provider that is an NGO or a research institute rather than a company. And only had a company would be uh, eligible and not this other uh, model of mm. uh, contract. So there's a lot of alignment that is to be made. And also, I think there is this um, practice inside, uh, not practice the word, but inside the behavioral science community, we kind of have the same rhetoric. So we use the same uh, narrative to explain our idea, the same vocabulary or uh, the, the process itself or, or on how to apply. You know, this rigid structure of behavioral design where we define diagnosis and tests. And we are talking a completely different language of a, a public officer that has its own priorities. So maybe, um, instead of having the focus on how to convince uh, other people about the, uh, uh, the incredible thing that behavioral science is, we have to shift the, the view on how to understand what they're doing, how they're thinking, and how to complement what they do with behavioral sciences. Uh, so it's not a matter of explaining what nudges are and let's uh, apply this nudge product which it's actually one more thing to do but the other way around how we can contribute to solve the, the problem itself so mm -hmm. i think that's kind of part of, of the barrier uh, when the agenda is not like something on the mainstream and actually maybe this helps on how to shift the, the behavioral science application from only nudge project or things that are uh, in the individualistic way and go to a more structured point of view, which is especially relevant here in Brazil when we have a lot of behavioral challenges that are not only a matter of individual choice, but actually have a lot of structural barriers due to inequalities or uh, access to, to public policies and stuff. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting, um, I think you're totally right. And, and it's really interesting to go through the layers of, of what you have to navigate to get certain projects going, the relationships, the intricacies, you know, between a certain type of company or organization. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that I think once the first path is cleared, it gets a little bit wider and then the next person gets to walk up and it gets a little bit smoother and then it, it goes and goes. So I guess my reaction is uh, encouragement and, um, and keep going because it's, it's an easier path for the, for the next project or the next group. Um, and the other, the other thing that comes to mind that I think is really, really interesting was based on the second part of what you said, which is um, speaking the same language with people and not having to convince people. 
I think, you know, we've all had conversations in, in our work, be it uh, in all or, or even personal relationships where you're really trying to convince someone of something that like you totally believe in, you've spent a lot of time thinking about it and you could just talk and talk and talk and talk and they are just not going anywhere. You know, it's like a traffic jam version of a, of a conversation. Um, and then there's the other person you talk with and instantly you click and they're like, tell me more. No, no way, tell me more. And you're, you're going back and forth. And one of the lessons that I've had, and this was doing, I, I think some of the work with the, the US Soccer Federation and in other organizations is that within organizations and organizations themselves, like being able to find that person or that group who just says, tell me more in the first five minutes, basically, and is, is, is I think worth paying attention to, I guess I would say, um, because we've all spent so much time. And I think it's a little bit, maybe it's a little bit of our, our belief in what we're doing with behavioral science is we believe, we really believe in it. We really think it's important. And so it's like almost obvious that somebody else should, should think it's important. Um, and so it, I think that can create a little bit of a blind spot to not perceiving if somebody's open to it or not. Um, that's at least been, been uh, my experience in, in some projects that I've worked on um, with some partners and things like that. Um, whereas if I had just paid attention a little earlier, I think I would have this is like the Annie Duke article we published on quitting. It's like, if you can, if you can figure out, you know, uh, what to give up on, it actually frees you up to go do something where um, you're going to be super excited. And, and there was a, you know, we're always having to figure out what do we say yes to? What do we say no to? And this is, it's like a problem everybody has with work and ideas and everything. And um, I, I work also for the author, Dan Heath, um, who's written some books, uh, Made to Stick, Upstream most recently. And he said when he was working on Made to Stick, um, which is about why some ideas stick around and others you forget, a, a, reader, a reader emailed him and said, you know, her phrase was, if it's not, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no, basically. Um, and that's, and I've heard, I know, I know people have sticky notes to say like, say no on their desk and everything, but I like, I like this one. If it's not a hell yes, say, say no, because um, in two weeks, when you got to wake up at 6 a.m. to go to some meeting or work on some report, the hell yes, you're going to be, you're going to do it, right? It might be tough. You might have to drink extra coffee, whatever. You're going to do it and it's going to be great. But the no, oh, that's going to, that's going to really wear you down. That's going to wear you down. So I can, I guess my answer is I hope, I hope, I hope all of the work that you all are doing in Brazil is just clearing the path for more and more people to do, to do good work. Um, and um, if you are running into um, to people who are, are putting up a wall, maybe, uh, maybe just cut your losses in, because I know there's, there's um, amazing teachers and amazing doctors and amazing hospital administrators and, and people out there who um, it's just a matter of, of finding, of meeting the right people basically. Um, so um, I, if I, if I had a, if I had a network in Brazil, I would, I would, I would share it, but you are my network in Brazil. So now if anyone comes to a problem with me and they have a question about Brazil, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, send them to you. So, uh... Evan, all, all great things uh, come to an end. We are getting close to ours. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's uh, uh, quite late for you for you there too. Uh, so my, I mean, one thing that uh, I'd like to give you space uh, to, to to share with us uh, is that I mean, most people know behavioral scientists the the, the website, but I mean, you mentioned uh, the you mentioned. Uh, the print edition, which is now on the on the second edition. So, if you could share a little bit on, on the on the rest of the platform, and uh, and especially, I mean, what are the plans for expanding or at least expanding the reach of mm -hmm. behavioral scientists? It will be a 
a nice touch. And then I, I believe our Arthur, Arthur has a, a final one too. Sure. So um, at Behavioral Scientists, we've done two print editions. Um, the first one was, was kind of a, a small test of stuff we had published online and we just wanted to figure out, ah, oh, there we go. Oh, it, it, it blanked out. I think you have to be a person, Arthur. Arthur's holding it up, but it's... Uh, um, Put in front of you, because we can't oh, see it. Oh, there you go, there you go. And Flavia had it as well, maybe? Oh, there's Brave Me's World, no. I thought you were holding it up. Okay, great. So, um, so there's, the, there's the print editions. And th they were really fun to create. Um, they were awesome. They were kind of tests. And one of the reasons we really wanted to do it was because we think there are really big ideas um, that are more fun to think about when your email and your Slack is not dinging you nonstop. And so that's why we felt print was really important. And we tried to tailor the content to being offline, being deep, you know, whether you're riding the train or you're, you're, you're reading on a weekend or reading at night, um, a chance to um, kind of have a delicious intellectual meal, so to speak. Um, so we're hoping to do more of that in the future and hopefully trying to figure out uh, a format that is sort of repeatable, maybe twice a year, we'll see three times a year, four times a year. I don't know if we, I don't think we'd want to do more than three or four times a year because um, I like thinking about ideas for a little bit longer than that. And um, and I have had weekly magazine subscriptions that end up just piling up and then I recycle them. Um, so don't want to, don't also don't want to create more recycling work for people, um, want to create, you know, where people like know it's coming and, and they can spend the time to think about it. And Part of that goes into what you were saying about reach, um, which is what we're hoping to do is if we can continue to build a network and understand what's happening where and incorporate different voices over time as we're able to publish more on the website, we hope the, web, the website's gonna try continue going and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. But in the print, you are kind of then creating this, again, a shared kind of moment when, Everybody's getting um, some really big, interesting, meaningful questions at their door um, three times a year. And you start kind of creating um, this like hive mind or something where, you know, you're planting a lot of seeds or church. And, and this isn't for us to, I think, spread answers. This is for us to spread questions. Um, I think mostly spread questions, spread inspiration. Um, spread ideas about how you do the craft of it. Um, it's much more about the craft and the process and the questions um, part of it than it would be about, this is exactly what you do. Because as we just talked about, um, what may work in the US doesn't work in Brazil and vice versa. And we may be missing a lot of the creative things that could come out of Brazil by emphasizing the US too much. So um, on the website, we're gonna kind of keep keep plugging away and that's gonna be a proving ground for trying to do more established authors, more emerging authors. We're gonna try and continue to deliver the newsletter. Um, we've got aspirations to cover more research and more projects. Um, you know, if you are a newsletter person, we send our newsletter out um, weekly, about a weekly cadence. And um, we do put effort into the letter and setting up the ideas and we share things from the archives. So I think it's, it's a, a valuable five minutes um, every week. And, and then, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's where behavioral science is going and we're hoping to do more of, of, of this bigger stuff from, from people who are around the world, um, bigger questions, meteor questions um, from more diverse writers. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I have a, a final question for you. Uh, we had this amazing conversation, very open. And I, I would like to know which question were you expecting or hoping for us to, to question you, to ask you, and we didn't. Mm -hmm. I think you guys all asked really great questions. Um, I don't think there was one, I, I didn't have, 
I didn't have maybe because it's it was 10 o'clock my time when we were starting, but I didn't have I didn't have tons of expectations. Like, oh, I hope I, I hope they ask this, or I hope they don't ask this. I was really, I was really um, happy to be here, happy to share. I hope hope what I was saying was somewhat interesting or useful, or you know, at least um, uh, you know, give some food for thought. And I really enjoyed getting to hear you, all your perspective about what's happening in Brazil, how you how you're perceiving the the research and challenges and the and, and things like that that's been it's been really awesome and i um i can i only want to learn more so it's, it was really helpful for me thank you very much we had a a wonderful time thank you once again for joining us thank you everybody for staying with us thank and you very much Evan. it was great thank you everyone it's great to thank great you, to Emma. see you great to meet you happy to be here um good luck and uh you know, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, uh, the, the organizers definitely have it. So thanks and have a great night. Thank, Thank you, Evan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. For us, that's, that's just the start Bye -bye. Of, the, Bye -bye. of the 2023 se season. So mm -hmm. expect more. We are working for it. Take, take care. Ciao, ciao, gente. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Henrique, tchau, tchau. Boa noite, pessoal. Até a próxima. Boa noite, gente. Boa noite.